All right, everybody, welcome back to the Real Estate of Mind show. We are your hosts, Glenn and Amber Schwarm. Hello, everybody. We help everyday people create wealth through real estate investing just like we did. And I hope you're awake and ready to rock and roll because our guest today has already got all kinds of amped up energy and he's ready to go. He is we, bringing it. He, we love it. It's great. And uh, so I want to kind of jump right in and maximize the time because I feel like he's going to. So I think that's <laughs> great. So um, I want to introduce uh, right now from San Diego, Mr. Paul Ross. How are you doing, Paul? Good morning, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to do what I love most, yeah. which is to teach and to open minds and to, frankly, fry brains like bacon in a pan. <laughs> I love that. That scent of a frying mind is what I love most. <laughs> so you are a master hypnotist. You are an author and an unconventional sales trainer. That's kind of the best way to summarize yes. you. Yes. Tell, tell us a little about you. Let's, I want to hear some. You've got well, lots of energy. <laughs> Bring so it. I have been doing hypnosis for over 30 years, and I've learned some tricks of the trade that are not, when you think of hypnosis, most people think of a watch swinging and people going to sleep. But I learned a style of hypnosis called Ericksonian hypnosis, which is conversational. So I can through what seems to the untrained ear to be an ordinary normal conversation create states of consciousness in the other person's mind of wanting to believe me wanting to be led by me to be attracted to me if i'm on a date to to that me selling i was wondering i was wondering why i find you so attractive today i was very confused by that but now i know why <laughs> <laughs> well i haven't used any of it yet so my teaching is that in any kind of selling any kind of negotiation any kind of communication with yourself most of that communication actually takes place on the unconscious or subconscious level i use those terms interchangeably it doesn't really matter whether you call them subconscious or unconscious so the language of suggestion is what I'm teaching people, both in terms for their own mindset and the way they want to affect the mindset of the person who they're negotiating with or who they want to buy from them, hire them, et cetera, et cetera. So if you try to rely on facts, data, et cetera, your information is going to go in through the critical factor of the, of the mind. I want to create different states of mind, different states of consciousness. This is totally crazy. This is, I won't swear in your show. You can. What I teach, <laughs> okay, what I teach has been called batshit crazy because yeah, it's, it's completely fine. different from traditional models. That's why I call it unconventional. So let me start with a metaphor or do you want to ask a question? Yeah, I, I do. What, what I want to say, Paul, is this. I want to, you know, a lot of our listeners are um, real estate investors or first time real estate investors. They want to be real estate investors. They just gotten started. So there's a lot of negotiation that goes along with that. And That's it's right. not just negotiating to buy the house. It's negotiating for the contractor, how to get the deal done, negotiating with the lawyers. You know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on that. The and sale I, of the house. Yeah. The sale of the house at the end. If you, if you, if you're hiring the right agent, there's a lot of that that goes along with it. So I feel like a lot of the stuff you can talk about our listeners can really use in That's many right. aspects, not just some people think, well, negotiating is only to buy the house, but we're negotiating is also to get the best deal with a contractor or negotiating right. to, get, to get the deal done on time or to, to get along with them or whatever. I, I got one even better. It's yeah. about negotiating anyone else who's in the decision-making process, like your significant other or a business yes. partner, yes. your significant other in, in particular. So how you go about influencing these people, I guess a sneaky, it depends on how you want to frame it. I think of it as an elegant, uh, subconscious way to do it. Sure. So, so the first part of that, I think, if I can dive in here, has to, do, has to do with your own mindset. Do you really believe that you can win at the game or do you have a way of correcting it when you make a mistake without getting into self-blame and reinforcing that mistake in your mind? So it starts with your own mindset first. How can you learn to communicate with yourself in a way where you can, number one, and hear me because this is very precise, number one, convince yourself that it's possible for you to succeed. Number two, when things don't go your way, learn how to look at what you did without getting upset emotionally, without having going into an emotional reactive state. Number three, learn from every experience. I want to ask you guys a question, Glenn and Amber. Yeah. How many times have you heard the piece of advice, learn from every experience? Oh, sure. Yeah, all the time. Has anyone ever given you a specific process on how to do that? I don't think so over the years. I'm no. Saying, let's, let's have it. 
No. So this is the thing that, uh, that really got me upset when I was first learning all this. So how do we go about actually taking that little piece of advice and turning it into a process where we get results? So the first thing you need to do is to create a state of mind where you're no longer looking through your old beliefs and emotions. You're looking at them. It's a state of detachment. How do you go? You need to create a state of detachment. And the first thing you recognize is what did I do right? When I do coaching with people, I insist that their orientation, the start of every call and the start of any group training is what do you do well? What did you do right? Tell me about the last five things you did where you were competent, where you did things right. It could be from the smallest to the largest thing. It could be anywhere in that sequence. So the first thing you need to do, build that state of a compassionate, clear-minded, non-attached witness to what you've done. Now, this is so, after somebody has failed at something, right? You're saying now you, right. failed, now you go back and look at it, keep yourself right. attached. You start to look at it keep from your, a detached. And keep your self-esteem up so that you know you've done good things in the past. Well, so. actually, if I can take issue with that just for a second with respect, I don't think there is a thing called self-esteem. Like the fluid, he's, I don't know what you're drinking there, Glenn. Is it? My protein shake, just a bunch of green stuff. Okay, and yeah. so self-esteem is not like a level of fluid you have in your body and you go into the mechanic like you've got your oil too low and they add a few extra quarts. Self-esteem is a series of interlocking processes you do in your mind. And one of them is the ability to learn from your mistakes. If you have learned helplessness, that you don't have a process for changing things, then your self-esteem is going to be low because you're going to be constantly doing this when you walk through the world when you have a good learning system when you have what i call learning confidence that says i'm going to go out there i'm going to be interested in my results but invested in my skills when you can get lock in that mindset because champions yes they're they're dedicated and devoted to their to their success but they're invested in their skills Yes, they want to win that basketball game, but they're invested in constantly improving their skills. In a br breakfast of bacon and eggs, one animal is interested, the other one is invested. <laughs> That's, That's really the good. metaphor I like. Very I good. Like. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, the, yeah, the chicken is uh, interested, huh? <laughs> right. That's right. good. So, so getting back to this answer, creating this state of mind where you believe you can learn to do anything, and when you first notice, what did you do well? This is and now I learned this oddly enough as a dating coach. That's my other career that I did for like 20 years. I was a dating coach for guys who are 30, 40, 50 years old, never had so a date in their life. The real you, life hitch. You were like hitch? Yeah. <laughs> oh God, no. No, no, no. No, no. More like Tom Cruise and Magnolia. Okay. <laughs> in fact, I don't know if you can see this over my shoulder. Do you see that little plaque? I can I see do. a plaque, yeah. That's a picture of Tom Cruise and a picture of me from a uh, Dutch newspaper that did an interview. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, wow. That's pretty cool. How about that? So I had to deal with people who were really emotionally invested in their failure, and I had to get them to stop dwelling on their mistakes. Here's a universal law of the mind. When you dwell on mistakes, when you ask yourself, why did I screw up? Your mind is going to look into the past, and it's going to dwell on those mistakes over and over and over again. And there's no difference between what your mind dwells on and what you're reprogramming it to do. And your mind, your brain is only going to do what you program it in. That's the cycle of learned helplessness. So you make a mistake in an effort to learn from it with a crappy learning strategy. You stare at that mistake in your mind over and over and over with a lot of emotion attached to it. Then what happens is that's just programming in that ineffective behavior. So of course, when you go out into the real world, you're going to repeat that behavior and the whole cycle continues until it's broken. Yeah. We preach this really big in our, you know, our, this podcast is called the real estate of mind show and our company, we, we, we put on the home flipping workshop, but our, our, it's our parent company is Vester pro and our tagline is a real estate of mind. And what we believe, what I think has really set us apart is that, we don't just teach real estate investing. We spend a ton of time at our workshops going over mindset. Matter of fact, we have one starting tomorrow morning and I'll spend the first three hours going over mindset and helping them reprogram some things. Because as you know, if you don't have that right, you're not going to make the money you need. You're not going to get out of your own way. You're not even, some people can't get the first step. 
Some people that's say the, I'm they don't even do it. Yeah, people. Think that's why the first the first four chapters of my book are strictly about mindset. Can I give a gift? Can I give a bonus? Oh, yeah, out? Please, please do it. Tell me how to find you and tell okay. us do that now. And right. you out and at the end. I'm going to give a bonus right now. Three words. I'm going to teach three words. I normally only do this to my VIP clients. I'm going to give your audience three words they can put in front of any limiting belief to wipe them out forever. Are you ready? We're ready. And again, I came up with this because I was dealing with guys who were ready to slit their throats because they were 40, 50 years old, couldn't get a date. Here it is, up until now. So if your limiting belief is, I just can't be disciplined enough to be a good investor, put the words up until now. Up until now, it was my experience that I didn't have the discipline to be a good investor. When you put the words up until now in front of any limiting belief, it has a hypnotically powerful effect because it says to the unconscious mind, yes, the problem was real. You're not making it up saying, I am a great investor. I am a great investor. If you do that, your unconscious mind, which run the show, has thousands of memories of you saying, no, I'm not. I can't do it, blah, blah, blah. And then you're going to have a tremendous internal conflict. And the process of change and progression is going to seem a lot more tiring and be a lot more difficult than it needs to be. So up until now, it does two things, three things. It gets rapport with the unconscious. It binds the problem in time. It says, yes, I had the problem and now it's bound in time. And third, it detaches it from your sense of identity. It's no longer about who you are. It's just what you did and skills that you lacked. So uh, the belief, I just can't be focused enough to be a good investor becomes up until now, I could not focus enough to be a good investor. Yeah. And then I add in what I call ownership and skill language. And now I claim my learning of my skills to be a great and to have the focus to be a great investor. So we don't make it about identity. We make it about behavior and skill. And may I share why? Oh, please. As a hypnotist, and I've worked with a lot of people and helped them change, changing someone's sense of identity is very difficult. It's at the very top. Changing someone's beliefs about what they can do, their skill set, is much easier. Have you ever had the experience of having a friend who's quite attractive and you compliment them, but they think they're unattractive and they say, yeah, but I look a little fat in it. And right. No matter how you try to tell them it's not true, they yeah. just, the compliment bounces off because their sense of identity says they're not attractive. Yeah. So we always want to bind a limiting thought in time, get rapport with the unconscious and separate it out from the sense of identity. This is profoundly powerful. I do a whole 90 minute workshop on just this one little bit, but it's profoundly powerful. So go out and try, I challenge your audience, go out and try three words. Just put those three words in front of any limiting belief and see what happens to your ability to hold on to it. Paul, how would you handle that exact situation of someone that says, I'm not attractive, I'm fat or whatever? So, so the reason I would say, our well, daughter, like our 16 year old daughter right now, she, I would say, and, but she I would say, I would say, well, I'm, I'm very clever with language. I would say, I agree. First of all, I would be clever. I would say, I agree. I have no right to change your opinion about yourself. So that gets rapport. I agree. <laughs> I have no right to change your opinion of yourself, but it sneaks in an implication. It yeah. sneaks in that it's only her opinion that she's fat and unattractive. It's inside of what appears to be agreement, you're beginning to sneak in that little bit of a crack in her consciousness. You understand? It's implied. Yeah. Whatever you can imply will be perceived as being the person's own thought and they, will re they won't resist it. So I agree, I have no right to change your opinion about yourself. But you know, a friend said to, who's having a same problem with her child said to her, now I'm using quotes, I'm saying, oh, my friend said this. It's not me saying it. So it's lessons of resist resistance. Up until now, you have had, you have been having the experience of 
you've been having the experience of doing the activity of feeling unattractive. I know that sounds like a, a mouthful. You've been having the experience of doing the activity of feeling unattractive. So it's no longer about the identity. You're progressively dissociating it from the identity. I'll offer you guys a gift. If you want to get back in touch with me, I'll do yeah. a little like half hour training with just uh, you two and, and yeah. teach you the exact wording we can role play. We'll, we'll, well handle this. For tell you. our audience, I'm, I'm actually curious of your background. Are you primarily self-taught over the years? Are you I've had the, well, yes, yes. And a lot of it was self-taught, but I've also had the advantage of being just like win the lottery, the mega million lottery lucky with my teachers. I have had incredible teachers. The founder of my discipline, neuro-linguistic programming, the co-founder was one of my teachers. Okay. My meditation teacher, I consider to be the most brilliant human being I've ever met. I found him. My mother, who was a profoundly brilliant teacher, who taught me how to think contrarian. She said to me, Paul, she, if most people think one way, most people are idiots. So find a different way to think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, good. it's a very, it's not a good way to be popular, but it is a good way to find some breakthroughs in thinking. Yeah. You know, it's interesting with, you're, you're right. Like people think of, you know, the watch and hyp hypnosis and, you know, that e even even the thought of it, like when you hear someone say, I'm a hypnotist or whatever, it's like, oh no, what are we into now? But I, I love your approach in this and that it seems a lot more psychology based and, and you know, the self-talk that we even give ourselves. And Amber, to me, <laughs> hypnosis and influence is not about controlling someone and narrowing them down. It's about expanding their mind to include new possibilities. So it's not, selling is not about narrowing people's cho choices. It's about expanding their consciousness to include choices that their limiting self-beliefs didn't allow them to see. Have you had, to, have you had the challenge of having to um, be put in the box of what people normally think of a hypnotist? I reframe it very quickly. I can reframe it super quickly. I'm really good. I am a wizard with words. <laughs> Word wizard. <laughs> so I, I love that you are helping people. I think that what I'm really what I really am taking out of this is that the the self-limiting beliefs, I can speak from personal experience. I've been an entrepreneur. I'm 52 now. I've been an entrepreneur since I was 19, right? So I've had to battle, battle, battle. I one of the, you know, I'm a, I'm an 80s child and I, I like all kinds of weird music, but I, one of the things I like is uh, Megadeth and it's a song that says, oh, wow. <laughs> there, there, there's a, there's a war inside my head. If I take a day off, I'll be dead. And I've used that quote a lot. And I remember that that's constant. We've got to remember because we are all, many people beat themselves up on a regular basis. And I think it's, it's an, it, you need to have a habit. Like you're talking about, you have to be able to change your language of how you talk to yourself to be able to get past those self-limiting beliefs. So you're giving people tools to We're, do that, not just saying, hey, hey, steps. hey, think differently. Hey, think better. You, you're giving yeah. me that step. And let me unpack, that's brilliantly correct. Let me unpack it further. So I was dealing with someone who's depressed, who came to me and said, I'm depressed. I said, I get it. How does it change your experience when you now say, I am having the experience of doing the activity of depressing myself? totally separates it right it totally separates them and it implies that they are an active participant ah. in the depressive process rather than not a victim doing it active participant now that by itself doesn't heal anybody but it creates the space and consciousness yep. spaciousness and consciousness creating space and consciousness is what my meditation teacher taught me enables a tremendous amount of new pathways to open up inside that spacious consciousness. If you don't, there's only, this is not meant to be a pun. He taught me there's only so much real estate available in consciousness. Yeah. So if that real estate is taken up by ne negative beliefs and limited thinking, then you've got to clear that stuff out. Just like with any piece of good property, if the plumbing doesn't work, if the elect electrical activity isn't good, uh, except if the foundation is cracked, if there's mold everywhere, I don't care what the outside looks like. You need to fix all that stuff. Yeah. I think that, you, again, I'm, I'm <clears throat> smiling because tomorrow morning I'll be in front of a couple hundred people uh, on Zoom and uh, we do all that virtual now. And I spend the first three hours, I talk about that. I, I sort of, I love, I love the up until now 
Share it. I train a one word thing. It's very similar. I add the word yet in the end of a sentence. So I, I, yeah, I say, I say the power of one word. People say, I, you know, I can't, I'm, I can't be a successful real estate investor. I say, yeah. You know, I add that one little word. Same thing. I love the concept that you have. It actually is a little better than just the one word. I, I would say, okay. add in the word skills. I would say, I've yet to claim my skills. Yeah to enjoy my success at being a real estate investor. Now, notice the words. This is where we come into what I call ownership language. Claim my skill, claim and my. I didn't say I have yet to, I have yet to get these skills. Yeah. I said claim and I said my. What's the difference between saying these skills and my skills? Yeah. yeah. It's profound. And it's claim perfect. is a powerful word. When you go to the valet back before everything was shut down, did they give you a want check or a claim check? Claim it's check. mine. Exactly. So, so what we want to do is with the negative stuff, we want to get away from ownership. With the positive stuff, we want to get past want. Fritz Perls, the very famous psychotherapist who created Gestalt therapy said, one of the biggest lies in the world when clients come to me is when they say, I want want is, is coming from a position of lack. But when you say I claim, that's transformational grammar. That's trans, trans formational mm -hmm. use of language. Language is magic. Language is very, very powerful. Again, from getting a date to changing your own beliefs to negotiation, it's all hooked up and linked in together. L language structures consciousness, drives, uh, shapes decisions, and drives behavior. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I love what you're saying to our audience today, and I hope you guys are all listening because I hope you're taking notes. I hope you're listening and replay this because, as you know, we preach the the real estate of mind. We preach that you've got to have your mind set. And I'm, I'm, and Paul, I'm sure you've seen people that you again have potential. You almost want to give them a compliment for it, right? They have great potential, but they can't get out of their own way, right? How, how do you help that person? Because we have people that come to our workshops all the time. They're like, I just want to do it, but I've just always failed. Everything you're saying now is good stuff. Is there anything specific you can give to those people to help them if they've had kind of a lifetime of talking just shit in their mind? Like they're just nonstop. Because right. Yep, I got it. You want to know what it is? Talk to ourselves, right? Our most gonna... important person we talk to is us. So when you have those habitual thoughts, I've got it. It's going to sound new age, mystical, schmistical, but you can't, first, what you want to do is, is less than what I called FID, F-I-D, frequency, intensity, and duration. I learned this again from my meditation teacher. When painful thoughts and emotions arise, rather than trying to erase them, what we want to do is diminish their frequency, which is how often they occur during the day, their intensity, how much they grip your emotions and, and, and tighten your body, and their duration, how long do they last. So let's say each one of those has 10 points of subjective suffering. So if you get 10 points for frequency, 10 points for intensity, 10 points for duration, uh, then that's 10 times 10 times 10 that's a thousand points of suffering. But if you can reduce the frequency to twice a day, reduce the intensity to a three, that's two times three is six, reduce the duration to a three, that's 18 points of subjective suffering versus a thousand. Anyone can handle an 18. So the only way to do this is to develop a meditation practice. I need my meditation the way a type one diabetic needs her or his insulin. I just recognize it's something I have to do. I do nine minutes a day, every day. And then on the weekends, I'll do a day of 20 minutes. That's where you need to start. Uh, and developing a meditation practice, I do something called Vipassana. It's insight meditation, where you just focus on the breath and you allow anything that arises in consciousness to be there. You don't fight it and you don't grasp onto it and you let it disappear. This begins to condition the mind over time, over time to be able to develop that witness consciousness where you can see your mistakes and not identify with them. What would you say to somebody that has struggled with meditation? Like I love yoga. I love, I, I've tried to meditate. I just. You're, I, I would say this. Yoga. I acknowledge that up until now, 
you have had the experience of struggle <laughs> with meditation. Oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah. And I'm wondering what it's like. I wonder what it's like for you as you now begin to recognize that perhaps there's a different way to do it. And I don't know all the results you can imagine that will occur as you find yourself doing that. But let me give you a pointer. Let me suggest my teacher's book, A Beginner's Guide to Meditation, because okay. it's completely different. You will never quiet your mind unless you're a very accomplished master. My mind is very seldom quiet, but what I do is watch my thoughts arise and I notice the moment they disappear. Even the most gripping thought will disappear. And in that moment of vanishing, there's a tiny little micro hit of peace, the peace that goes beyond human understanding. That's, uh, I, I, you know what I think I love the most, Paul, what you're doing today. I, number one, that was pretty fun to watch you that do that was. with Amber. I just saw, I just saw what you did. That was great. That was, yeah, you, you like took it off you, put it back on her and, and made her, made her separate it, made her, yeah, that was good. I like that. Um, the, when you gave the, the FID, right, the frequency, intensity, and duration, I think I like the fact that you gave people a plan instead of saying, you know, some people might just say, well, you have to stop thinking bad. Well, that's not so easy to do. I mean, you can't, no. you can't just stop. Of you course know, not. Program for 30, 40, 50 years. How do you stop that? Right. So you, you're telling people, Hey, let's reduce. I love that word. Let's reduce the intensity of it. Let's reduce the frequency and the duration. And over time, that will give it's a process. Yeah, right? Now here's how you reduce the intensity. When I have very painful thoughts arise, I acknowledge, I bless, I love, and I release. So I'll say, thank you, beautiful, beloved thought. Thank you for coming up with the intention of being my teacher and my guide. I release you now with love. And when you do that with painful thoughts, you acknowledge that they're there. You thank, you bless, and you release with love. Their power to grip that dramatically decreases the I in there, the intensity. It won't necessarily decrease the, it very quickly will reduce the intensity. And these things all tend to be comorb, uh, that's, I don't wanna use that term. They tend to affect each other. When the intensity drops, the frequency and the duration will naturally drop. In my mind, it's easiest to go after the intensity than it is to go after frequency and duration. Once you diminish intensity, frequency and duration naturally drop along with it. I love that because you're not, you know, feelings are neither right or wrong. They just are. And you're not right. telling someone, you know, don't have that feeling. You're saying, you know, maybe don't let it go quite as deep and don't let it last as long. One of the tricks I've used with people is saying, you know what, let yourself feel it, but don't get stuck there. Cause it's when people get stuck in their negative feelings that it becomes a problem or one of the reasons and so you need to give yourself 30 minutes to have a good cry, set a timer on your phone and let yourself do it, but don't, you know, pout and cry about it for three days, you know, give yourself five minutes or 30 minutes or whatever time that you need to, to get it out, yeah. but then you move on from it. Yeah. What you stuff, you gain, you give momentum to what you indulge in becomes your view of the world. I'll say it again. What you stuff, you give momentum to, but what you indulge in becomes your view of the world. So they're both dangerous and some people go back and forth really stuck people in my therapeutic experience do both they both tighten around and then they'll flood they'll freeze and they'll flood they'll freeze and they'll flood and in relationship this is even more difficult because you don't know what to expect from your partner are they going to flood or are they going to shut you freeze you out this is often the structure of a trauma so the structure of a trauma is freezing, flooding, and no sense of time. To the traumatized person, I didn't want to make this about psychology and trauma, but we're going down a rabbit hole. No, so okay. we'll, we love, we love the, psychology. We love this, yeah. To the traumatized person, there's no sense of time. Everything, that trauma, whatever it is, is happening right now. Right. Does that make sense? Totally. It, it does. And I think another reason I really love this particular um, podcast is also because, you know, people people get into whatever industry they're going in. Our listeners are, are primarily focused on real estate and they think it's all about the mechanics. I need to know all of the how to's, whether it's construction. And we know that it's probably 20% mechanics and 80% psychology to, totally. to really be successful. So I, I love that we're bringing a lot of this full circle. Paul, what was it you said? What, what, you, what you stuff, you give momentum to. What was the second one? What you indulge in becomes your worldview. So if you're constantly indulging 
and sorrow and you make it about who you are and you mix it in with with uh constructs of despair and self-blame or blaming the world or helplessness then it becomes the filter through which you see everything i'll say this again a big change happens when people are no longer looking through their emotions or through their filters or through their beliefs but are looking at them someone could come to me as a hypnotist and say i'm afraid of heights and i can hear that that's a minor change but helping them build a place in consciousness where the they're, they're looking at their patterns rather than through, through them, where they're no longer looking through fear at all at anything is a transformational change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so look at emotions, not through them. That's, that's awesome advice for people. Um, it, it reminds me of, um, wait, going back just a little bit, it reminds me of that uh, Indian proverb, the wolf, which wolf you feed. You know? Yes. Yes. I love that. Which wolf are you going to yeah. feed? Although I have cats. So it's a matter. There's, <laughs> they normally like to, I was going to say interrupt. They normally like to co-broadcast with me, but they're both taking their early morning, mid-morning transitional nap. <laughs> this has been, Paul, this has been great. This has been a little unexpected for me today and great. And it Thank really, you. it takes, it takes what we believe in, what we teach to a whole new level different and, perspective too yeah yeah different perspective very on interesting it. perspective yeah. yeah i think it helps i think it'll help our listeners to understand too you know we we believe in this in the mindset change and we also i've learned through time personally that it is a process and it's an ongoing process and you have to be always vigilant and protecting and thinking and you know the the, the skills of emotional management are not taught but they're crucial skills like, the, and also so is the skill of making good decisions, which is also not taught. So there, uh, there are many skill sets that people have just simply not been taught and they think there's something wrong with them or they're broken when they're simply lacking a skill. So the skill of learning from your mistakes of emotional self-judgment of making good decisions, they're not taught in school. And so people are running around thinking that there's something broken in them when in reality, they're just lacking skill sets. That's my overall view. Paul, do you use your tone of voice to change how uh, people relate to you? I do. How did you know that? Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, Chris Voss. Is that his name, Chris Voss? Of course. Never split the difference. Yeah. So I was just in a, a one of our masterminds, and he was a speaker, and they sequestered me, and I was the victim, and 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 ever he told everybody what he was going to do to me, and I didn't you were know. The negotiator. I, I was the, yeah, I was the negotiator for an FBI or um a bank robbery and every amber was on the call she was not sequestered and and I came, chris was the robber no i'm i'm in 200 of my peers top investors around the whole country i'm in front of 200 of them and they put me back on and he just rips it and i'm all prepared to have a logical conversation on negotiating these these bank hostages or the hostages out of the bank and he just ripped i'm like holy shit like he just ripped into me and i'm like uh, uh, uh. it was just really funny how he could and he told everybody what he was gonna do beforehand but you know it was great the reason i asked you that question is i noticed when we like <clears throat> before we even started <throat> the podcast you know you got on with us and you started off with the really high you know up pitch singing melodious voice and then as you're talking well, so you have his radio voice yeah. but i'm also but i also have the hypnotic voice so i when i want to embed suggestions i get a little bit quieter and i pause so if I would say, you know, I don't know at which point you might stop and find yourself getting much more excited about what it is, I'm going to teach something amazing today. I don't know how you'll discover that for yourself. So when I, I'm exaggerating it so your audience can hear it consciously, but to influence subconsciously, I pause a little bit. I drop my volume just a little bit and I speak softer. So I embed those suggestions. If my normal tone is this, my volume will dip here and my voice will get softer. I love but that. you you wouldn't hear it consciously. You would pick yeah. it up unconsciously. And you as a woman, being more intuitive than your partner, pick it up. It's great for dating. Uh, <laughs> look at my face. Look, look at this face. And my girlfriend is drop dead gorgeous. So it sort of gives an ugly old guy the an even playing field when it comes to dating. Hey Paul, I want to go. I want to go back for a second to something you said before, and I want to ask you your thoughts on it. You said that that uh, we are not taught emotional, you know, health. No. Or, now, but let me let me ask you this: up until now, would you agree that maybe your 
we are taught the wrong way by our folks, by our parents. And unknowingly, we're taught how to suppress. We're taught how to use anger. We're, we're not taught how to be healthy. We're taught a bad way. Most of us, oh, and not not because our parents are, are, are horrible people, but they, just didn't, they, they were never taught. Until someone like you comes along and becomes a teacher to somebody, how in the world do they know the right way to act, right? They don't know that yeah, anger is bad. They don't know. They that. don't. They're not gifted with emotional maturity. or. Emotion. They don't. Well, th they don't. And I'm funny. I'm just reading a book called It Didn't Start With You. It's a oh. book about generational and family trauma. Now, I don't buy into all of his theories that's yeah. transmitted in the DNA. I think children are just very emotionally sensitive and they will emotionally model, <laughs> excuse me, what they see in front of them. Oh, here comes my co-host. This is Neka Jane. Uh -huh. Neka is a kitten. Mm -hmm. She's about a year old, but she's not going to live to two years old if she keeps it up, because <laughs> she is a punk and a, and a half. Hey, Paul, I'm going to challenge something that you said there, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this. I have a daughter who was brought up, up. So I have a daughter that's 33. I'm 52. My daughter uh, was born when I was in high school, and we oh, wow. gave her up for adoption. And I didn't meet her for 15 years. Now, when she was 15, wow. she came back and found her birth mom and I, who remain friends. And um, when her parents are amazing people, they are very straight laced. They've probably never been in trouble in their lives, hardly. I'm pretty much the exact opposite, right? Entrepreneur my whole life, always getting into trouble, whatever. My daughter our da was the same exact way, and they couldn't figure it out. Now, I found out she's now 33, but years later, I found out that they brought her to meet. She wanted to meet us because she couldn't relate to her own parents. It's just funny about you mentioned about the DNA and I would have agreed with you before, but I have a different experience. Like my daughter is so much like her birth mom and I, and not, not like, you know, her, so her adoptive. I agree. I disagree though. Cause a lot of those are personality traits versus um, emotional my, maturity. Yeah. But she was, but she was, but her mom Glenn, was very different. Glenn, was very Glenn different. Yeah. my statement to you as someone who likes to think in a critical and scientific way is I don't know. I, I just, I, I simply don't know. Yeah. I just look at the clinical evidence people present and I say, can they draw the conclusions they draw from that evidence? And I say, I don't know. I think the sign of an intellectually mature mind is to say, I don't know. And to actually get excited about saying, I don't know. Yeah, go figure it out. Don't be a punk. Daddy is doing work. Well, I've got a question for you. Um, do people have to be open to hyp hypnosis for it to work? No. And can you make someone do something they normally wouldn't? Yes. So there's a lot of myths out there because either the hypnotist can't do it or they it would scare the public. But absolutely, people don't have to be consciously open and uh, and they don't necessarily... See, here's the thing. I think most people are in a trance anyway. They're tranced out by their limiting experiences, limiting beliefs. My job as a hypnotist, like when I met my girlfriend, she told me after things had gotten romantic that she was not in the least bit attracted to me. But it was something about the way I talked. And she said, within like 20 minutes, I felt just totally fascinated by you. And then within an hour, I felt like I was your entire world. And uh, I don't understand how that happened. I just giggled to myself because I engineered the whole thing. I engineered it with the topics I spoke about, with the questions I asked by embedding suggestions. I engineered the whole thing. Now, we genuinely deeply love each other. But still, what if I had allowed her narrow view of which up until that time she felt attracted to, to stay there? I use trance to expand her vision of what could be attracted to her, what could be attractive to her. So you're not tricking her, you're, you're expanding. Getting her yeah, yeah. more open-minded to- I'm, in, I'm in, right, I'm expanding. Yeah, I think what you said is powerful too, that, that you know, we are, most people are in a trance of their own world, their yeah. own- stuff, Absolutely. Their own walk, their own so when you say to them, hey, you're, what you're kind of saying is, hey, I have a new way for you to look at life, but I can't come, I can't tell you that directly, you shut me down. So let me right. try and come in the back door and get you to open your mind. Of you course, know. that would not be useful in negotiation, would it? No. <laughs> not at all. Life, life is yeah. sales, though. Like, all of life is sales. Everything so is a negotiation. If not with others, it's a negotiation with yourself. Can right. I do this? Will I do this? That's, that's Can, am I capable of doing this? The, I believe, look, the human brain is a marvelously 
adaptable plastic plasticity is is a big the ability of the brain to adapt i like to use this example the number zero the number zero allows us to do banking negotiation it's a placeholder but up until the time that some nutty southeast indian person came up with the concept no one even understood what zero meant but now everyone understands zero but the brain pathways to think of zero have been there for tens of thousands of years. It just took one person to open up that neural net and then everyone could open up that neural net. So there's so many different pathways and language is an incredible key to open up those pathways and those doorways into different states of consciousness and to different ways of thinking. This is why master your language, master your thinking, master your thinking, master your actions and your, and your reality. This has been this has been an amazing um, podcast. I really really enjoyed. Told this. you so. Told you so. Told See, you so in the beginning. You did. I so I'm aware of that. <laughs> as you're talking, I'm thinking. You said you're going to go longer. You're still going to enjoy it. And so I'm laughing as you did. And he just so. did the voice change. Again. He did. I know. I know. He's, he's, uh, you're obviously great. Tell tell our listeners how they can connect with you. How they can learn more sure. about you. So I created I created a rapid sales accelerator course. It's absolutely free. It's a training. It has three elements. It has the first four chapters of my book, which are only and completely about mindset. It has a 23 minute, how do you like that for precision? A 23 minute audio training. And I structured it that way because the average commute is about 25 minutes. 23 minute audio training that teaches you principles I used when it started when I was nine years old that I've used to make millions of dollars. And then finally, I have a PDF report a white paper, as you call it, on destroying objections. You can get all of this by going to paulrossbook.com. That's easy to remember, paulrossbook.com. That's how you reach out to me. I love doing this. I would love to come back on the show. I, I hope you can see, as I said before we went on the air, that teaching is the greatest joy of my life. There's nothing I enjoy more than this. No, you're, it's you're obvious. Yeah, you're fantastic. And we uh, I want to thank you for being here today. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's been it's been really great. So. Our listeners are going to get a lot out of this. Good stuff. So guys, I hope you took a lot of notes today. I, this has been uh, this is right up our alley. Those of you guys who've been to any of Amber's in my workshop, you know that we are all about mindset and uh, uh, walking into this today, not knowing we had some uh, glitches where I didn't get the sheet on Paul and I got it. We started talking. I was like, man, this guy's right up our alley. So <laughs> exactly what we do, right? The Real Estate of Mind show. And this couldn't be more appropriate of a topic for us. And you really dove into some great stuff. So I hope you took notes. If you didn't go back and play this again, uh, you will share this podcast. I mean, this is a, this is a gem. Yep. So and go sure to paulrossbook.com. So. Very good. All right, Paul, thanks again for being here with us today, buddy. Hey, I loved it. Thank you for the opportunity from my heart. You got it.